thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm, I'm thrilled to have this uh, conversation with everybody and I'm looking forward to some of the questions. I looked through them um, already and I, I see that they're really uh, a great match for what I'm hoping to, to discuss with you today. Uh, so in general, this is about work and well-being in cars. And uh, at the University of New Hampshire, we've done uh, some work in this realm for um, maybe 10, 15 years. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then some, also some ideas about, you know, sort of an overview of the field is what I'm hoping to, to get to so that we can have a, a good discussion about all of this. Uh, and in a moment, I'll figure out how actually for, uh, oh, here we go, I can move slides, great. So I'd like to thank my students for, of course, a big part of what the, the, some of the results that I'll be presenting. Clearly this picture is out of date. You can tell we didn't just take this the last couple of days, but I like it. And in fact, I, I see that Nadia, who's in this picture, who's not at UNH anymore, is in this picture and she's also in the talk. So hello, Nadia. But um, uh, anyway, I really like this picture. I'm looking forward to you know, getting back to one of these events soon. All right, so recently, uh, we, uh, uh, a couple of colleagues and myself, so Chris Janssen, Stella Donker, Duncan Brumby, and myself, looked at uh, the history and future of human automation interaction in uh, the IJ, IJHCS. And um, this is, I think, really important for this discussion about, about cars and well being and work because in fact, the big change that I think is, is really coming is that cars are increasingly becoming automated. And uh, I wanted to show you this figure from this, this document, this overview, which kind of shows you our view of where automated vehicles, automated cars are. And I think they're at this intersection of, first of all, automated systems, right? So there are a whole host of automated systems that people have looked at through many, many years of research and development. So in this red uh, uh, circle, you see things like an automated psychological test, something that people have wrote a lot about, or of course, power plant monitoring, one of the big applications that we all always think about when we think of automated systems and humans interacting with automated systems. Then this other issue comes in, right? This idea that you have a time sensitive safety critical system. So a fire alert is that, but you don't necessarily have to do a whole lot of HCI with it, the thing goes off. Uh, but certainly power plant monitoring, that's a big question, right, for HCI, because this is an automated system. It's also time sensitive, safety critical. So how exactly do you best do, you know, how do you involve the human in this? And then another aspect of this is non-professional users. So power plants are monitored by professionals, thank goodness. But an online chatbot, not so much. Your uh, robot vacuum, no, right? Um, but then the automated car, well, that's you and me. Those are non-professional users, right? So here we have an automated system that has time-sensitive safety-critical issues, and it's operated by a non-professional user. So wow, right? As far as HCI is concerned, and a whole host of other questions, of course, as well, uh, I think this is both just just really uh, a challenging situation but it's also of course a, a situation that that provides a great number of opportunities for us so let's take a step back though so as you think of cars there is certainly a great deal of change like what we've talked about a moment ago but there's also this continuity so when you look at these pictures which i took from a, a kai course in 2017 that i was a co uh, instructor on you know, we still have steering wheels and those are probably going to remain with us. We have a whole host of gauges and pedals. But of course, if you look at that 1923 car and a relatively modern car, one of the big changes is, is evident and that's the huge explosion of user interfaces in the car. Something on the order of 200 different buttons and displays and whatnot. Um, and so certainly there is this tremendous change. Now, I like to think of change, or I, I think of change in, in the car domain as something sort of recent. And um, I uh, read this book 
Business Adventures, 12 Classic Tales from the World of Wall Street by John Brooks a couple of years ago. And it's a really neat book if you haven't had a chance to read it. As it says, it's a bunch of business adventures. One of them, though, is about this car. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. I was not familiar before I read the, the, uh, the story about it. This is the Ford Etzel. And the Ford Etzel, as you can see, was on the market between 1958 and 1960. And when you take a step back, you realize that's an awfully short period of time. People will not develop a car for simply having it on the market for two years. And of course, that's what the story is really about, which is that Ford managed to, you know, spent $250 million at the time on developing this vehicle and ultimately, you know, had to pull it. It was a big, it was a big flop. But what I th thought was interesting is that there was already, or sorry, at that time, so this is late 50s, right? This, this car was called the epitome of the push button era. And uh, there was great excitement about it because it was one, one person called it a devilish assemblage of gadgets. And indeed, when you look at what the car looked like, it does look like a devilish assemblage of gadgets. For example, those push buttons that you see, I cannot point to them. Well, maybe I can, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but down here to the, on the left side of the, um, of the gauges, there are these push buttons and apparently they were so light to the touch that you could change them with the push of a toothpick, which isn't necessarily a good thing, I think, in a car, but the bottom line is that the interesting thing to me, it sort of hit me that while we, or at least myself, we like, I like to think of change as something that is recent, clearly it isn't recent, even, you know, in something like the car, changes have been occurring for a long period of time. They've been with us for a while. Now, at the University of New Hampshire, one exciting uh, uh, body of work that we, we have is this uh, Project 54 system. And I don't know, I usually like to ask people how many had a chance to sit in a police cruiser. And a funny joke about this when we're all in the same room together is that I have a little pause and I say, well, I don't discriminate if it was in the front or the back. So you can sort of imagine that this is sort of funny because I'm implying that you might have been sitting in the back of a police cruiser where, you know, because you were arrested. But that joke doesn't really well, work well, I think, on Zoom. So if you had a chance to look at a police cruiser, whether from the inside or from the outside, you you probably notice that they're actually quite busy places. Uh, they have all kinds of equipment from the radar to the radio to lights and sirens and so forth. And um, one issue with this, of course, is the user interface. How do you create these user interfaces so that they're easily accessible and safe? Um, the interesting part about um, police is that the police car market is relatively small. Um, it's, let's say, 1999 when this project started, the uh, annual sales in the US were 15 million new cars and about 150,000 of those were police cars. So it's a tiny market, right? And along with this goes that the, the makers of those devices that go into police cruiser, cruisers are also serving a relatively small market and they're relatively small companies with little incentive to uh, collaborate so that devices can interoperate. And interoperation is important because if you have different devices, they can usually do more in a system together than separately individually. And even at, at, at the simple level of, well, it would be nice to have a single unit that controls things in contrast to having multiple boxes with buttons and so forth. Um, that cannot be accomplished unless you integrate things. And so Project 54 was a design to integrate devices on police cruisers. And we've had some decent, decent success. We had about a thousand vehicles on the road in daily use, mostly in the state of New Hampshire, but also, for example, in Massachusetts with the state police and several other places. Um, here's what the system looked like. So we integrated these devices. We, in the center console, you see the original devices and on top of it, the graphical user interface. And it was basically a, a PC with a GUI. And uh, it also had a speech user interface, which is nice because you could issue commands such as change the radio channel to, you know, Boston, change the radio channel to Worcester, or uh, issue commands such as give me the information on plate one, two, three, four. And when you think about what police officers have to do, well, you know, they'll turn on lights, they'll turn on the siren. Uh, 
but that, as you might imagine, is a relatively simple thing that they can flip a switch for, and you probably don't need speech for that. On the other hand, more complicated tasks, such as finding out something about a car that you're about to pull over, such as has it been stolen, is it registered, that actually takes more of an effort because you actually have to call someone on the radio, you have to perhaps wait for that dispatcher, and that person types in some sort of a query and then they come back to you. Well, here, uh, voice interface actually shines, right? Because it allows you to, to, to create this connection more you know, seamlessly. And of course, it also retains the, the return information for you because it's digitally transmitted information in contrast to ephemeral voice that you somehow have to remember. So um, one uh, paper that I quickly wanted to introduce here is this, this work that uh, we did on exploring how people use the interface. And uh, we recorded data from, from cars on the road. And so let me, let me show you what we found. First, this graph tells you uh, the number of systems that were in use on a daily basis in the uh, state police uh, New Hampshire State Police. So each data point here on the x-axis you see dates, on the y-axis you see the number of systems. So this is the number of systems that called in and said I'm here on any given day. So you can see that from January 2003 to like to roughly January 2005 this, this number grew to about 200 cars a day that were on the road and then ultimately by uh, January 2003 the system was no longer in use. Uh, by the way, you also see some interesting drops in the middle there, and those happen to be due to um, uh, problems with their radio system. Okay, so we took part of this data, specifically between January 2009 and November uh, 2011, and we looked at this particular question. So do people use the speech commands? And we found the number of speech commands issued by in, in each of these vehicles as time went on. And so what you see in this graph is the 95th, the 90th, 80th, and 70th percentiles, uh, uh, sorry, the, the number of speech commands for the 95th, 90th, and so forth, percentiles of users. So the top five users, uh, top 5% of users, the people who use the system the most, so that's the 95th percentile, that's the blue line, issued between 20 and 25 commands a day, roughly, right, on average. And then as you go down, you get to the 90th percentile, that's about 10 commands, and then you see the 70th percentile. So that's the bottom 70%. You can see that they practically didn't issue any speech commands whatsoever. So this is interesting, right? To some extent, clearly some people found the speech interface useful and used it I don't know, perhaps that's a moderate use, 20 commands a day. It's, you know, depending on what your job is, right? Are you pulling over cards or are you moving from point A to point B to do, you know, deliver some sort of a paperwork or whatever? So that clearly impacted it. But it's interesting to see that this is roughly the actual usage in a day to day, on a day to day basis in a police department. Um, what did they use speech for? Well, it turns out mostly those queries to remote databases. So they wanted to find out about someone's driver's license or a plate number or, or a registration basically, right? And again, that is a very, that's, what, that's where speech can shine, right? So if you would like to find out about someone's you know, driver's license, you on the normal basis have to call up your dispatcher and then say, okay, give me the information on plate one, you know, plate one, two, three, four, the person, type. it's a long process but with a computer and speech interface it becomes simpler. And then it turns out that what we called here a patrol screen is pretty much uh, changing radio channels. So in New Hampshire, and I, I think in Massachusetts, exactly the same, state police cover the entire state. That means they might have to talk to hundreds and hundreds of different local departments and change their radio channel to that local department channel. And uh, that's on a normal basis done with tiny little buttons. Uh, which while you're driving is clearly not a very good idea. So this is where, um, again, speech shines because you can issue commands such as change the radio channel to you know, Boston PD uh, and you don't have to remember or, or work your way through uh, a way to push buttons to, to accomplish the same. All right, so 
that is a uh, work that wrapped up a while ago. Um, but you know, one thing that we also talked about to be, to start with is automated vehicles. And I, um, I uh, really like this book by Isaac Asimov, The Caves of Steel. It talks about Earth about a thousand years in the future. And in this book, the people of Earth have robots. They're highly sophisticated robots. For example, they might work, they're humanoid robots that might be working in a uh, shoe store and helping you try on shoes. So these are very sophisticated uh, robots, but people are afraid of them and they don't really like them. And there's this big tension between humans and robots. But one thing that I found interesting is that the protagonist uh, jumps in the car and drives. So even though there are these robots that are basically almost human equivalent uh, robots, the people still jump in a car and literally take the wheel and drive. So I don't know, what do you think is uh, the future of, of driving? Are we gonna be driving? Are we gonna have automated vehicles? And people have conflicting you know, lines of thought on this. I suspect a thousand years from today, we're not gonna be driving. I don't know when automated vehicles are gonna be a reality in that I jump in and the car just goes, but I imagine a thousand years from today, that is exactly what's gonna be happening. Unfortunately, I really can't say anything about a lot, <laughs> you know, the next five years or 10 years, but certainly, I, so the expectations people have for automated vehicles would be something like this. So Fernando Lipschitz, this is his video. You can take a look at it online. And um, I think what's really cool about this video is that it tells us, um, and let me see if I can get to the next slide. Um, no, I can, okay, I don't know how to get to the next slide. Well, I'll figure that out in a moment, but, um, oh, I see, there's a little button, not that, okay. so. I think what you what we see in that video are things like safety, right? So one thing that is important that that's an important promise of of automated driving is safety, and then another one that we saw there is um, a better use of of the infrastructure, right? So cars were platooning, uh, they were weaving through, there was no there were no lights necessary, and so forth. So there are all these really great promises of automation. There are pitfalls and. Uh, my kids love Wally. I don't know if you if you've seen the movie Wally. It's a, it's about a robot, and this robot goes through all kinds of exciting things. Finds himself um, on a uh, spaceship where people basically don't really move anymore, and they they fly around in these automated chairs. So clearly, automation you know might have a downside too. And then of course there is this that the fact that automation is really not all that great. So this is a video I recorded. Maybe two years ago. This is my kids laughing. You know, this this device had one job, which is to just stay, not move, just stay there, right? That was the only request that we that the person who left it there made, but it didn't quite figure that out yet. So obviously automation has a ways to go. But if if we can get there, right, with what, what uh, this idea here of unprecedented collaboration between technology companies and traditional vehicle manufacturers, we can expect that autonomously driven electric cars will change the world, right? And that is because of those things that we've seen as far as safety goes, as far as uh, road utilization goes, but also something that I think is really beautifully uh, shown in this, in this figure by Stevens and colleagues from, from their CHI 2019 paper. So, 
here they're exploring this idea of, of traveling in an automated vehicle. And uh, this automated vehicle is good enough that you know you can get in and actually it drives you, it drives you to work. So in 2018, this vehicle doesn't exist. So you have your breakfast, get in the car, you travel, then you work, then you travel home, and then you do things like you, I don't know, you relax, you have dinner and so forth. In contrast, maybe in 2033, which I believe is, what is that, 25 years, right? Uh, no, 15 years, okay, my math is not good tonight. Um, if the car is good enough, perhaps you can get up a little later because you can have your breakfast while you're driving. And then while you're driving, you might start your work. And in fact, on the way home, you might do some work and then even relax, but get home sooner than you would have gotten home had you act, you know, in 2018 when this paper was written. And perhaps you can fit in some sports before dinner and by dinner, you're kind of caught up with the same time schedule. So the promise that this, this figure gives us is that travel time can be substituted instead of having to pay attention to the road. Well, you can do other things that are both work and well-being. And the result might be greater productivity, perhaps more work, but also additional you know, time for you to perhaps relax in the car. What are some of the downsides that we see here? Well, maybe more work is a downside, right? Maybe now that you're in that car that can drive itself, your boss can say, you could be working and you're not. So that's not okay, right? So, but that's clearly a political issue. So that needs to be resolved. Also notice the travel time is longer. Now that could be good and that could be bad. So maybe what happened is that given that you can work in your car, now you're happy to live further outside of your, away from your work and you don't mind the drive right? But it is still a drive or maybe traffic is slower. I don't know. There are multiple options here too. And of course, um, I'm really interested in the future of work and, you know, this is part of the future of work, but you know, none of us are, well, most of us, sorry, not none of us, but many of us are not commuting, right? And many of us might end up not commuting or at least not commuting every single day like we used to. So that's going to have a, that's going to be a twist to this uh, figure as well after the uh, after this crisis that we're living through. Trouble is though, cars are really not that great to work in. So this is me working in a bus and you know, this is the state of the art, isn't it? So if I'm gonna work in a car and hopefully I'm the passenger, then I can take out my laptop and I can do some writing. Um, here's a, another video, which hopefully I can show you. This is, this is an Uber commercial. And what can you do in the car? Well, you can take your laptop, you can take your tablet, you can take your phone, sit in the back and do work. Now this is again, state of the art. This is an Uber commercial, right? This is what you can pay for right now and uh, get as a service. Here's another um, Uber commercial. This is Martha Stewart. Now I really like this photo because this is what I'm, Kind of excited about so not necessarily that you're going to create suites but what are those other things that we might be able to do while we're in the car um, if that car is automated so you know she's preparing this this port and then she has this this beautiful printer i'm really curious about ideas of of what it is that what other things can we be doing and i know one of the questions that i saw on the board earlier is um, related to, you know, what kind of tasks can we really engage in? Deep thought tasks and so forth. But that's a really great question, right? And I think those are questions that haven't been answered and my lab and, and my, our collaborators are, are working on this as well as many other people. You know, what exactly are the tasks? How do they align with the type of automation that you might have in the near future? So with that, let me tell you about the this uh, NSF funded effort between five universities, New Hampshire, uh, and then I, I think a lot of you know, or a chair from, from Wellesley College, Rafael Sadun is at uh, Harvard Business School, Linda Boyle is at the University of Washington, and John Lee is at Wisconsin. And our project is this to call the next mobile office safe and productive work in automated vehicles. So that's exactly what we're looking at right now. How can we develop, how can we help people be both productive and also support their well-being, assuming that we have automation that actually works pretty well. 
Now, I think that when I talk about automation, it works pretty well. What, what to me this means, and I'm curious about what this means to you, but it's in the near term, my guess is that we'll be able to do this Durham, New Hampshire to Boston drive with a lot of segments that are going to be automated. So perhaps right now this takes me an hour to an hour and a half and I have to drive the entire way. Well, perhaps in the next five years, we'll get to the point where half an hour of this, the car will drive on its own and I'll be able to do something else. This isn't perfect. And the car might very well say, you know what, you need to come back and you have 10 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever it is to right now come back and help me. But still, it's considerably better than what is today, which is you're going to drive. And if it's bumper to bumper traffic, you are going to drive and that thing can be done. One thing that we were, were really curious about, and this is where Rafael Sadun is, is leading the way, is understanding what, uh, what are the current practices and what are the needs uh, that are driving this, this uh, work to actually allow work in cars. So we are, uh, in this particular case, we, we conducted an MTurk study asking people, well, what is it that you currently engage in when you're commuting and what would you like to be uh, working on? And in fact, we're, we have another study that we're just uh, completing the write-up. So hopefully I'll be able to share that with you soon. But in the MTurk study, we have 220 people and, um, 148 commuters, 126 drivers. And when we asked them, what work activities do you do while commuting? Here's what we got. So for example, thinking and reflecting, phone calls, reading emails, replying to emails. You know, the reading emails and replying to emails are not necessarily the best things to do, of course, if you're driving. There are also people who program and you know, listen to podcasts and so forth. So some of these things you might expect, and then some of them are perhaps sometimes concerning. What would people like to do in a self-driving vehicle? So we asked this question in terms of, imagine you have a perfectly safe car that's self-driving. Of course, people do have concerns about safety and that's, that's a valid concern. But let's assume that they're safe. Obviously they have to be safe because before they can be used like this. What would you like to do? And people said, well, more reading email, more replying to email, to a little bit. Uh, interestingly, less thinking and reflecting. We were a little surprised by that, but, but there it is. So these are certainly preliminary studies and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get some, um, we'll get a, uh, an article out pretty soon about uh, a bigger study that we con conducted. But it's interesting, right? We really are excited about this idea of, of tying our work, our technology work, which is where our lab is, to understanding what people's behaviors are today and where would they like to be, both from the perspective of the worker and also from the perspective of their, of their employer. And um, our hypothesis is this, <laughs> this figure. So we think that three technologies will be very helpful in creating a safe, but also a productive and, and, and pleasant environment in these automated vehicles and these vehicles that are that can drive themselves for some periods of time and then you have to take back control. So we think that augmented reality will be one of these technologies and then speech interfaces as well as tangible interfaces. So augmented reality in this figure, you see this person wearing some augmented reality glasses and that creates some sort of a, uh, that, that projects some information. For example, in this case, she's on a call and it projects information about who might be on the call if it's being recorded, just like our Zoom recording is happening here now. And in, in addition to that, some document that is related to this, to this call. There is also a speech interface, so she can say something like, add a new bookmark, right? I don't know if you listen to podcasts, but one of those things that is really not there right now is if I do listen to a podcast, there's, to me, no good way of, of bookmarking. The best way I can find is to quick text my wife and say, you know, I'll look at, listen to this amazing sentence and then sort of type it in and now, now I have a record of it. And then um, remember that picture of me sitting in a, on a bus with a, with a laptop, that is not realistic in a car when I'm a, a driver. And the reason it's not realistic is that in the short run, um, the car will call you back to drive in a short, for, with a short window of time. And when we say short, I mean 10 seconds. So for example, there's a really nice video of the uh, Audi Q8, 
with a demonstration of, of automated driving on a highway. And this is a vehicle that's on the road today. The system isn't turned on yet for um, non-technical reasons, but the time that they give you to return to driving once they issue a warning is 10 seconds. Now imagine yourself sitting in a car with a laptop, 10 seconds is not enough for you to stop what you're doing, you know, fold the laptop, stow it, and then resume driving and understand where you are. That's simply not good enough. So in this figure, you see these tangible interfaces that are small devices that either allow you to input or receive information in some form, but they're small. So the information throughput is small too, but also they're easy to stow. So again, between augmented reality and speech and these, um, uh, these smaller devices, tangible devices, we believe that you can create an interesting interaction. Now, of course, we have to be safe. And if the car is going to ask you to come back to driving, that part of it has to be foolproof. It must be something that you can do. So the, in this next figure, you see that the augmented reality supports driving. For example, it can be a navigation device. Uh, speech is still there, right? It can either give you information or you can uh, instruct the car to do various things. And again, the, the small interaction devices, right? The, uh, are, are stowed away safely and quickly. We also find that people don't necessarily want to work in the car. So if, if and, and this turns out to, to be a difference between going to work and coming back from work. Our work, our studies is showing that there is a big, there is a difference here. So going to work, people are, 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 re are getting ready and coming home, they might be not interested in working anymore, but decompressing, getting ready for, the, for what comes after. And so uh, one of the things that we're exploring right now is well-being applications. And we, we think this is going to be especially good on the way home. So in our lab, we've actually done some work with augmented reality in, in a driving simulator. So what you see here is a picture of uh, Hitta van der Mullen on the right. He's wearing the HoloLens, the HoloLens 1. And in the middle there, you see a picture of what the HoloLens displayed to him, which is a window with a remote conversant. So this was a Skype call, basically. And so we simulated talking to people via Skype while you're driving. Granted, this was not automated, but manual driving. However, as far as you know, gaining some experience with, um, I'm showing this because it's interesting, I think, to me, to see that one of these experiences with actually having augmented reality while um, while, while in a simulated car. Another thing that I think is really important, and again, this goes back to that question that I saw about what tasks are, are uh, good, you know, appropriate tasks for the car. Again, with Chris Janssen and Shamsi Iqbal and Stella Donker, we wrote this paper on what does it actually look like if you are engaged in a non-driving task, so the top left, because your car is in an automated mode. But then the car says, okay, you need to come back to driving and you have the safety critical driving task at the, in the bottom center. And then ultimately you can give back, give back the driving task to the car. And one thing that we, we wanted to point out in this paper is that this is not a, either you're not driving and then you are driving and then again, you're not driving sort of situation. It's not a flipping the switch from one to the other, but rather there are several stages. And importantly, there are interleaving parts where you are interleaving the two tasks, the non-driving task, perhaps you're writing a, a, a report or reading something and the driving task for some period of time, both when you take on that driving task, as well as when you release the driving task and return to the uh, non-driving task. So I think this is really important because this is something that needs to inform our decisions in designing user interfaces. So people will have some sort of an external alert, that's stage one, right? That's going to tell them, by the way, you need to drive. And ultimately in stage five, they will have this physical transfer of control so that in stage six, they can contribute to the drive. But before they do that, they might disengage from the non-driving task. So perhaps just look away from it. And they might orient themselves, they will orient themselves if they're driving safely to the driving task. They might look around, understand where they are in the lane and so forth. And then they'll suspend that driving task and finally go over to driving. The resumptions are of course important too. 
if we support the resumptions, that makes that's going to make the, the performance and your your task performance more productive, right? You will have forgotten a whole host of things while you were driving. And also, my suspicion is that knowing that's that the system is there to help you resume the task will make it less likely that you will dwell on that task while you're driving instead of focusing on the driving. So in an ideal world, imagine you have the person sitting next to you. This person is the one that you're working with on a task. That person would remind you after your, your driving is done and say, okay, Andrew, remember when we were talking about this, this IJHCS paper and uh, we were trying to complete this one paragraph and you were saying something, right? And so now I'm back in the flow of that, that task. So what can we do to, to do something along those lines in our system? So one of my students actually conducted an experiment along these lines. And, and the thing that she was trying to, to understand, so this is uh, Devi Nagaraju, um, is what exactly are, how are those stages lined up? So we have a model there with stages one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So what exactly is the order of those? How, are, how does that interleaving play out? How's this affected by different lengths of time that you give people to switch from the non-driving task to the driving task? And uh, so let me show you a video of, of what the experiment looked like. Um, so this is a low fidelity simulator. It's a driving game, basically. And what you see is that here, we're in this manual driving mode. And pretty soon, the uh, driver will get a notification that automated driving has commenced, and he'll be free to engage in a non-driving task. In this experiment, the non-driving task was uh, the 20 questions game, which is, you know, you need to guess an item from a list of items. And uh, drivers did that by texting. So here he is, he turned to this non-driving task. He could release the, the steering wheel. The, the car now drives automatically. And he's typing some questions regarding that task. Um, and then, he receives a, 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 a warning, right, to come back. Look, he's trying to come back, but he's also still typing. And then that early warning turns into, no, 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 you really have to do this now, at which point he pushes the button, which in our, in our system meant taking physical control, and now he's driving. So this video basically shows you this sequence of events, right, of, okay, you have a, a, a driving task, then you have a non-driving task, then you get a warning that you need to move back to the driving task. And in fact, in our scenario, we had a, an early warning, and then sometime later, a, okay, you really have to do this now type of warning, and then they have to switch. So we just had a meeting about this. Divi is um, almost done writing this up, but here's some preliminary results that I can tell you. First of all, uh, Interleaving indeed does happen, and I think you saw a nice example of this in the video where, where our participant basically was uh, engaged in the typing and then looked over, actually put his hand on the steering wheel, then went back to typing a little more, and then, and then actually finally took to the driving task. And in fact, the order in which the different stages happen isn't always the same. So it's not zero through 10 exactly in that order every time. Sometimes you know things shift, uh, shift around. One question that we asked is, well, how long does the interleaving take? So once you get a warning until you actually stop the task, the, the non-driving task, how long is that time? And we experiment in our experiment, we had two uh, lengths of time for people to take back control. The short one was 15 seconds, and the longer one was 30 seconds. And you know, in the short one, the interleaving average was about 10 seconds and the, in the long run, it was longer. People used up the time that they had available. And when they have that more time, the, the additional time to transfer control, one thing that was interesting in our scenario, in our game, people didn't simply complete a task, they started a new one. So meaning in the 20 questions game, they completed one game, but if they weren't actually forced to still take over uh, the uh, control, they actually started a new 20 questions game and then, then continued on. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, 
I think the important question, the, the important uh, lesson here is that there might be scenarios in the car where even though you gave people a warning and you expect them to sort of wrap up their tasks and then start paying attention to their driving, they might not do that. They might continue pushing with the original non-driving task, even though that might not be the most, the, the safest way to, to handle that task. All right, so let me wrap up with this, with this uh, paper by Magnuson and Pope. And uh, it's this, the review of biomechanics and epidemiology of working postures. And one important thing that I took out of this paper is that drivers often experience lower back pain as well as muscles, musculoskeletal problems in the neck, shoulder, and arm. And this is related to things like sitting for long periods of time or having to reach, and especially in environments that, that have high vibration. Now, remember that figure I've showed you from the, that CHI 2019 paper where they showed that the travel time might increase. And we said, well, of course, because your, your, your automated vehicle is such a nice place, you don't mind sitting in it for long periods of time. Well, this is something we do need to worry about, don't we? Uh, if we're going to create vehicles that people don't mind sitting in, they might sit on them for longer periods of time. And if that's the case, we really have to be careful so that we do not end up harming them physically with things like back pain or, or shoulder pain and so forth. So this is something we need to take into account as well. All right, so to wrap up, you know, today we have simple office tasks in the car, right? We saw that from, from our, our MTurk study. People sort of do what you'd expect them to do right now. They might check email, they might write email, perhaps even code, but not that frequently. And we certainly have high hopes for tomorrow because we see that automation is possible and perhaps for several minutes at a time, drivers might not have to drive. Imagine, imagine those commutes into Boston where it's bumper to bumper traffic on 128 and you're not actually required to look. You know, from the controls perspective, bumper to bumper traffic at low speeds is not that big of a problem. You can stop quickly, right? So, but, but from the driver's perspective, that to me anyway, sounds like torture. And if I can take that time and do something else with it, I would, I would really like that. And then the question is, well, what can technology provide here? You know, what are, so, what are the interfaces that make sense? And then again, what are those tasks that are appropriate? But we do have to pay attention to things like, oh, motion sickness. We, I really didn't mention that, but clearly motion sickness is a big issue. Looking away from a moving world might not uh, work well for everybody. Um, Privacy, we actually haven't talked about that, but you know, we, I focus sort of on this vision of, of you have your car, but what about sitting in an Uber? Um, clearly safety, and safety goes along with, you know, your automation is safe, but also once it returns control to you, how do you make sure that any of those tasks that you brought in and uh, do not interfere with the driving safety? And of course, ergonomics that like we saw on that last slide. So I hope you uh, enjoyed this and I hope we can have a discussion about this. And before I go to that, I have a, a selfish uh, promotion for you. So if, you, if, you're ex if you're interested in this idea of the future of work, then please join us. We have uh, a series of, ta of, of conversations on Thursdays called the HCI and the Future of Work. And uh, this is gonna be our fifth week now. We had some fantastic speakers from Ch uh, Shamsi Iqbal to to uh, Anna Cox, to Gregory Welch, and Stephen Brewster. And then this week we have Regan Mandrick joining us and we have several other people joining us as well. So if you have uh, time this Thursday and every Thursday from 11 to 11.30, then bit.ly hci-fwfuturework.com-convos, please join us. And that's it. So hope, I hope uh, you enjoyed it and hopefully we can have a conversation about this. Great, thank you, Andrew. That was really interesting, super interesting. Um, we have a few questions, probably more than a few, but we have a bunch of questions. Uh, the first is uh, concerns the survey you did with Amazon Mechanical Turkers. Uh, did you ask, how much did you ask about work versus non-work related activities? I, for example, this isn't my question, but I uh, guess that 
YouTube and Facebook would be much more highly represented there. So you're, you're right about that. And, um, you know, this was a, um, um, a time use study, basically. So people would enter um, what, they, what they were involved in. And so you're right, we, we did ask, you know, we gave people an op option, just tell us what you did in time increments. And then, mm -hmm. um, and so what we found is kind of what you'd expect. So people commuted in the morning and in the afternoon. And uh, there were more personal tasks that they conducted after the evening commute than any time before that. And then between the two commute peaks, you had the work tasks. So if you simply divided this into commuting and work and uh, personal, personal tasks, um, that's what you got, right? So you got mm -hmm. the double peak for the commute, mostly the big peak in the middle for working, and then the peak after 6 or 8 p.m. or whatever for, for personal tasks. So, um, and I think that, again, it also depends on who you ask, right? So one, one target that we have is uh, managers. And so it's really a very interesting question to me, but you know, who is asking the question? Uh, sorry, sorry, who's responding to the question, right? How much do they make? What is their job? Do they like it? You know, what, there's so many issues that go into this. And uh, I think that the simplest answer though still remains in the morning, people are probably more likely to be getting ready for work than maybe in the evening coming home when they're perhaps more likely to just want to decompress. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, next question is, uh, in a driving situation, if someone's attending to a non-driving task, do you feel like they can really regain situational awareness enough to confidently control the car in those kind of transfer situations? You know, that's a really, really good question. And it's a critical question. You, you cannot, you know, you cannot do these things without, without safety. And there are multiple studies that show different aspects of this. And some claim that let's say five to eight seconds is good enough. And, you know, it, and I think that this is a multidimensional problem that just needs to be carefully examined, both from understanding what tasks involve in terms of what are those, you know, cognitive abilities that you're employing and physical yeah. manual visual part of it, right? And uh, I think not every task is appropriate. So an extreme is you can't take a nap, right? Mm -hmm. Not take a nap and be safe. Um, and at the same time, uh, I, I do worry that you even writing might not be safe. And then in our game scenario, you know, in our game driving, people would, you know, uh, do their 20 questions and then continue going, not stop and get ready for driving. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there are clearly warnings that this is not something you can take lightly. Great, thank you. Um, in the driving simulator, was the, the, the participant that you showed, was he wearing a um, eye tracker? Yeah, there was an eye tracker because that's how we, uh, we, we, we basically tracked this whole business of, of engagement with one of the tasks through both eye tracking and then typing. Yep. And then, um, you know, the, uh, when the, the, I guess when he was prompted to re retake control of the vehicle, or when participants were prompted to retake control of the vehicle, if they did not do that, did you simulate a crash or, an, or you know, uh, some well, kind of dangerous event, or did the car just continue? The car went into uh, to manual driving, which could have caused a crash. And uh, I don't, know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think they're basically, that basically no one crashed, or if they did, it's very, mm -hmm. it was very frequent. So mostly people did what they were supposed to do. All right, great, thank you. Um, do you have thoughts on the, when, when it comes to a time when there's a mix of automated and non-automated cars on the road, and how that would impact overall safety or, or traffic patterns or what have you? Yeah, that's, that's a really neat question. So right now that, that happens, right? And we all, well, the stories about the Google cars that they get hit at intersections because they truly stop at the stop sign and, and people don't expect that to happen. Why would you ever fully come to a full stop at the stop sign and not a little ahead and not slide through, right? So they basically get rear-ended because people do not expect the behavior. There was a really nice paper by Brown and Laurier at high, let's say 2018 or 20, I can't remember. I think it was 17, 18. Um, 
they actually looked at videos on YouTube of people that people posted about what their cars did or what other people's cars did automated cars and, and, mm. you know, uh, so, you know, your Tesla that, that, you know, when you flick the, the indicator light will automatically switch lanes, mm -hmm. but there's a little bit of a delay. So the person who's signaling to you by slowing down to let you in gets tired of you or a car not getting in speeds up. And by then the Tesla com cuts across. So I think that that's definitely a very good question. You know, how do, um, my suspicion is that in the long run, automated vehicles will just be better. And they're, they're going to be the ones who are going to be saving the human drivers who are, you know, not always on the ball, but I guess we'll find Do you think out. we'll, do you think we'll reach full autonomous driving or do you think we'll be stuck in kind of the semi-autonomous? And do you think that if it is so dangerous that we should be using semi-autonomous vehicles? Um, I think that partial, you know, this, this is automated vehicles that work well in some scenarios are going to be great. Mm. And again, you know, if it's bumper to bumper traffic and you're going along at 20, 30 miles an hour, the, the controls problem is not that great. Mm. And even the cost of a mistake isn't as grave. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so if your car could only be automated at very low speeds, that would still be a pretty nice benefit because a lot of the pain of driving is exactly that, right? Day after day, you go to work and a good half hour is spent at 20 miles an hour and your input is very, very small. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have to suffer through that, that would be nice. So my personal view is that perhaps there are these niche applications and then, you know, what if the high occupancy vehicle lane became the automated vehicle lane? Again, you could control the, the uh, environment better and make that, make, that, um, make that automation task more manageable. And then in the long run, yes, a thousand years from today, we'll probably have full automation. I don't know if, how to, I don't know how quickly that's going to happen. And to some extent, my guess is it's not, you know, to me, I think I'm excited about gaining some of that time back. Uh, and I think we can get to that point relatively soon. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, do you, have you found, or would you expect to find differences in uh, people's uh, speed to, you know, speed or confidence or safety in, in taking control of the vehicle again, based on if the task they were performing was audio only versus audio and video, or, or maybe even talking to another person in the vehicle? Yeah, so, you know, talking to another person in the vehicle in regular driving has a, uh, has a protective effect. Mm -hmm. So epidemiological studies show that you're less likely to get into a crash if there is a passenger. Um, and that could be because, you know, maybe two older people driving right? They, they have team driving and that might be helping mm -hmm. you. Or maybe the person calms you down when you happen to have to get really angry at the person in front of you who cuts you off and the other person never gets that angry, right? It's always the driver who gets super angry. The other person sort mm -hmm. of less. Uh, so maybe that's the benefit. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's, I guess that's the, the short of it, that um, you could definitely get some, get some help that way. Thank you. Um, there's a personal question here. If, if your car has any advanced driver assist features, do you use them? I do. My car does have um, lane keeping assistance and my car has, um, um, what do you call it? The ACC, the adaptive cruise control. I find them to be very, very nice. You still have obviously to keep, uh, you have to pay attention if, if you've used adaptive cruise control, you know that things that are stopped appear like they don't exist, right? So just because the car is stopped in front of you, ACC thinks that it's the road. So you're gonna plow through that potentially. So you do have to obviously pay attention, but um, I think it's also sort of a, my, my anecdotal evidence is that on a longer road trip, driving behind someone with ACC, and just following their speed reduces the level of trying to get around people and so forth. You know, I would find myself 
going below the speed limit and being perfectly comfortable with it just because the car in front of me was driving below the speed limit and I never even thought about passing them. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's not a bad thing. We know that reducing speed reduces uh, mortality, right? It's a, yep. it's a, it's a quick, it's a court, it's a very clear relationship. Yep. Have you done any research or, or have you seen much research on how, uh, due to the differences in how different manufacturers implement these sorts sorts of systems, people either um, you know aren't sufficiently, we'll say, trained at the dealership, or don't take the time to learn them and find them annoying and disable them. Um, do very, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, the University of Iowa has a program called My Car Does What. And I think it's mycardoeswhat.org. And that's exactly it. People don't even know about the safety. This is about safety aspects of their car, not necessarily automation, but simply safety. And uh, people don't know. People don't know how to use them, and they're not aware of having them. Different car manufacturers call them different things. You know, Tesla's taken a lot of flack, and I think rightfully so, for calling their system autopilot. Uh, similar systems are, you know, People more, you know, I think calling it an, an assistance system is a much better approach. Puts people in the right frame of mind that this is not about, currently no car is safe to just not drive. You need to be driving, but it is an assistance, right? So uh, as far as speed goes and as far as, as uh, keeping you in the lane. So mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes. And uh, this is tricky because it's not obvious how you know, who, who does someone enforce this or is it just somehow market driven? Um, there, there is no answer to that just yet. Um, all right. Uh, so similar to that, or I think related to that as well, um, you know, due to that um, you know, wide variety of differences of implementation of these systems, you know, do you think that we'll see more adoption of autonomous driving it with in public or semi-public transportation like so maybe not a public bus but like an airport shuttle or something like that versus um you know cars that we we could buy yeah i think that's a really good point so you know subway right so i don't know i was in budapest a few years ago there their uh, newest subway line uh has some of their trains fully automated there's there's mm -hmm. no driver uh, but then again, it's a relatively simple scenario. You're on the tracks. So there isn't, you know, don't hit the person in front of you if they jump out. But beyond that, more or less stop when you're supposed to stop at the train station. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very, it's a very good, uh, and, and that there are some interesting experiments ongoing with some colleagues in Germany, exactly that, a shuttle, right? Um, and how do people behave with a shuttle? I think that's really a nice so simplifying the scenario, right? Simplifying it so that there are fewer variables. So it's always the same route. There are no pedestrians. Yep. Not even other traffic. Then that obviously makes it much much simpler. Yep. Um, have I, I would I would imagine not, but um, you know there are you know like you alluded to in in real transportation situations the possibility or likelihood of motion sickness like i for example i can't ride the green line because it's going to make me die almost instantly um but in different kinds of vehicles you have that to more or less of a degree do you have thoughts on um technology assisted ways that we can mitigate that so um you know stephen brewster who's um one of the people who participated recently in our uh, converse, weekly conversation, he does a lot of work with uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, and uh, specifically in cars. And so he's done some interesting work in trying to blend the motion of the vehicle to the motion mm. of the visual field. Uh, but this is clearly a big issue. This is not something that is in any way, shape, or form resolved. Uh, you know, I mean, I. I you know, even putting on VR glasses is not necessarily something that I, I relish doing, just sitting in my office. So um, it, it's going to be, a, I think, it's not clear that that's going to work for everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. right. um, there's a question that I don't know if, if 
this is in your field of uh, uh, oracle this predictability but uh, you know one of the one of the I think one of the big questions about autonomous vehicles is who's liable if the car is fully autonomous say the future with no controls for the user if there's an accident who's liable that's a really nice question so actually I was really fortunate I had a I teach this course on ubiquitous computing and one of my students was a, a law student he's now a lawyer and um, so it's an interdisciplinary course it's a joy to teach, and, and so he and I ended up writing a paper on on uh, H, you know, automated vehicles, HCI, and what are the legal aspects. And so it's it's, it's an overview of, of the legal landscape from the idea that you know you have international laws, and then you have the it, from the U.S. perspective you have national laws, and then you have of course state and and local. So who exactly is in charge of which things? Um, so liability, it, it's also a really cool question regarding, you know, I think a lot of you probably heard this, this whole trolley car problem, you know, should, should my automated vehicles kill me or should it kill the little cute girl? And what if the girl happens to be of a particular skin color or if it's a, you know, all these things, right? And in the, sh the, the short answer, I, I think it's not actually, you know, to some extent, it's that car right? We're, the car still, you know, if the car doesn't work, like if your car's wheel falls off right now, well, who's at fault, mm -hmm. right? It might be the, the car manufacturer, it might be your mechanic, it might in fact be you because you, you did something to it, right? So if you take that car and you don't touch it, mm -hmm. and the wheel falls off right now, what happens? It, it basically, I think not much will, will change from that perspective, right? So if the car has automation, Clearly, someone designed the automation. If they designed it poorly, you know, they will end up being sued. Uh, mm -hmm. If your mechanic did something and, and they did not adjust your, your, uh, your video properly, well, they will be taken to court. And of course, if you decided that you're going to not use it properly, like people right now don't necessarily use their automated vehicles properly, you know, putting that orange into the steering wheel of the, of the Tesla so that the Tesla thinks you have your hand on the wheel, you know, Tesla's not going to get sued for that. You're going to end up getting mm -hmm. sued for that. Or you're, you're going to be liable for that. So to some extent, it's kind of a predictable thing. Like, yeah, if, if you do bad things, you know, people will probably figure it out and, and you will end up liable for that. That's very interesting. Cool. Thank you. Um, so it looked like in the video you showed of the, the research participant, there's an audio signal to uh, take control back. Have you looked at other uh, kind of signal methods like visual fields if they're using augmented yeah. or virtual reality or, or haptics or something like that? Yes, so uh, people have done a lot of work on this. And usually the, the conclusion is usually that a visual plus auditory is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem with visual only is that people might not be looking in the direction of your of your notification. So if you have a notification here in front of you, you might in fact be looking over there because you don't have to be driving. So why would you be looking in front of you? Um, and um, haptic is tricky because haptic de mm -hmm. depends on your clothes, for example, your posture, your, your weight, your body uh, makeup. So I think those are not simple questions. There, you know, if you could put things on people's skin, that's another, that, that's another thing, but that's probably not the future we're looking forward to. Let me get into my car and, and place things on my <laughs> so it could, you know, because you could truly startle people by tapping on their backs, right? Yeah. But that really means something that is truly on you. Um, yeah. So haptic would be probably really, really good in some situations, but it probably is way too intrusive. Not probably, mm -hmm. certainly way too intrusive. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, are there any other questions that people have? Or, uh, Andrew, is there anything else that you would like to share? Well, I thank everybody for their questions and thank you for uh, sticking around. And this yeah. was really enjoyable. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, to note, everybody, uh, we'll be, you know, I'll be lightly editing the video and we'll be posting that later this week. We'll also be sh sending out uh, links and references, and uh, Andrew, I'll send you an email real quick.